My name is Ben Greenfield, and on this episode of the Ben Greenfield Life Podcast. If you have this in place, your child won't be deceived. They'll be able to make good decisions. They'll be able to make mistakes, and they will make mistakes. As it's so important. They're only a child once. They're probably 70 to 80% of the time in their sweet spot, which is you know what really makes them like their eyes twinkle. Faith, family, fitness, health, performance, nutrition, longevity, ancestral living, biohacking, and a whole lot more. Welcome to the show. All right, it's time for you to start hacking your sleep. And a big part of that is choosing the right equipment for your desired outcomes. That's where this company called Essentia comes in. It's an organic mattress that's the only mattress to score best in class on eliminating all sleep interrupting stimulants. They have a patented Beyond Latex organic foam technology. So you get these deep and REM sleep cycles that are unparalleled, allowing you to wake up being recharged and ready for anything life's going to throw at you. They make these things in certified organic factories packed with technology that allows you to get performance sleep benefits unsurpassed by any other mattress. Tested by Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. These mattresses are allergen-free. They've got these packed technologies that allow you to experience things like active cooling, EMF blocking, accelerated recovery, and really good deep sleep cycles. A lot of pro athletes are sleeping on these things now just because sleep is so important to pro athletes, but it should be important to anybody who's concerned about central nervous system repair and recovery. Now, they've even tested through something called dark film microscopy, the fact that these Essentia mattresses reduce the amount of blood clotting that can occur in reaction to EMFs. So they built in an EMF barrier foam that allows the blood cells to be in their natural free flowing state and allows oxygen to flow throughout the body naturally, which improves your body's nighttime recovery cycles and massively improves your sleep quality. So what Essentia is doing is they're going to give you a hundred bucks off your mattress purchase if you go to myessentia.com slash Ben Greenfield and use code Ben VIP, that's myessentia.com slash Ben Greenfield and use code Ben VIP. You may have seen me or heard about me wearing this little haptic sensation producing device around my ankle and around my wrist called the Apollo. It's a wearable. It's a very unique wearable. I interviewed the guy who designed it, Dr. David Rabin, on my podcast a couple of years ago. I've been using it ever since. I love it for sleep and for naps and for relaxation and for meditation. But you can also wear it for like party mode to increase social ability, to decrease anxiety, almost as like a social lubricant without drinking alcohol. The more you use it, the better it seems to work based on it training your nervous system to tune in to this, this little vibratory sensation that it produces more efficiently the more you use it. it has no side effects. You don't take supplements or medications or anything. It also helps to support your natural circadian rhythm and Apollo wearable users can get an extra 30 minutes of high quality sleep per night. They're even doing some very interesting studies along with the aura ring folks on how good this Apollo works for decreasing sleep latency how long it takes you to fall asleep and the actual increase in deep sleep, 19% more time in deep sleep on average reported by the Apollo wearable users. And they can access this data from the aura ring. They found 11% increase in HRV, 25% more reported focus and concentration, 40% less stress and feelings of anxiety. So pretty cool device, pretty easy. Just strap it around your wrist or your ankle and uh, you can experience it. It's, it's very cool. So you go to Apollo Neuro, A-P-O-L-L-O, Apollo Neuro, N-E-U-R-O, ApolloNeuro.com slash Ben Greenfield and use code BG15 for 15% off of this cool, cool little device. All right. I've been drinking this stuff at lunch. Usually I have bone broth with lunch, but I switched to this stuff. Super interesting. It's called Halon. Halon is well spelled H A E L A N. It might be Helon. I don't know. Helon, it, whatever. It tastes good. I think it's Helon. Anyways, it's called Helon 951. This is basically soy. And I, all, I know all of you are like, soy, you're not supposed to consume that, right? Now, understandably, there's lots of conflicting information out there. Uh, the short answer is yes, you should be consuming soy, but only if it's the right kind, which is pretty rare. Because genetic engineering and poor soil and improper harvesting means most modern day soy has some serious issues. And try and say modern day soy 10 times fast, I dare you. Uh, I did a podcast with Dr. William Lee from the Angiogenesis Foundation. We actually talked all about soy benefits, but uh, there's this Helon stuff. Get this. It's a concentrated nitrogen fermented beverage made from organic soybeans grown in the mountains of Mongolia. They have proven this species to be anti-angiogenic, meaning it doesn't feed cancer, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, and anti-carcinogenic. 
enormously rich in vitamins and minerals and a complete protein source, all your essential amino acids. People use this stuff now for energy, for better sleep, for detox, for longevity, for meal replacement, really great anti-cancer benefits as well. Now it's fermented and it's soy. And so it doesn't taste that good. I'll just come around and tell you. But what they do is they ship out like this mint powder that you mix with it that makes it actually taste really good. I just drink it on ice with this mint powder with lunch. And it's really, really amazing stuff. And I feel really good on it. I have a a peace of mind that I'm drinking anti-cancer every day with lunch. So you get a special discounted package over there and free shipping on a bunch of bottles of this stuff. Here's how. Remember this for spelling because it's a little difficult. Helan 951, H-A-E-L-A-N 951.com slash Ben. Let's say that again. Ready? H-A-E-L-A-N 951.com slash Ben. Well, folks, it's time once again to feature one of the superstar parents who is in my book, my upcoming book, Boundless Parenting in which I interview a whole host of folks who I have noticed over the years have been doing a really good job raising raising impactful and resilient and free-thinking and unique young human beings. My guest on today's show unfortunately isn't able to be joined by his significant other, but he is the leader of the Fat Fueled Family. That's literally what their business is called, the Fat Fueled Family LLC. His name is Danny Vega, and I'm sure that he will get a chance to share with you more about why he calls it the Fat Fueled Family. But basically, he runs an entire movement, YouTube channel, blog, podcast, along with his wife, Mora, dedicated to empowering families to eat better, to move more, to grow closer together. Uh, they have a lot of similar interests that I do, including you know things like unschooling and an emphasis on the importance of faith and family, rites of passages, and a whole lot more. So their chapter in the book, which is uh, now available at boundlessparentingbook.com, is absolutely fantastic. And in this interview, uh, we're going we're gonna to get into even more of the nitty gritty details behind some of the cool things that they share in that chapter. So I will link to everything that Danny and I talk about at bengreenfieldlife.com slash vega. That's V-E-G-A. I'll link to his website and everything as well. So bengreenfieldlife.com slash vega. And Danny, I'm sure you've been called out on this before, but I mean, with, with a last name like vega, uh, calling yourself the fat field family, I, mean, I think I think you'd go more of like the plant-based route, you know, kind of like uh, Dr. Paul Saladino with the last name has salad and it should obviously be a vegetarian, right? <laughs> Dude, I get I get people texting me all the time like the the vega protein, like the the vegan protein. I'm like, gosh, and they they know they know it's kind of like a trigger. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. There's yeah, there's a protein brand too called Vega. Yeah, it's very it's definitely ironic, especially with my wife. I wish you could be here. She's a, the superstar, but you know she's basically genetically um, just terrible for to eat like vegetarian and vegan diets. You know, the, a lot of her um, snips are are basically anti vegan. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so yeah. she, she, but obviously she didn't know that back in the day when she, she tried to do that and, and she felt terrible. Yeah. But yeah. It is kind of ironic. Yeah. It's interesting. I think a lot of people don't realize that genetic predispositions for things like methylation ability, for example, can dictate whether you yep. actually feel good on a plant-based diet. And, so, and some people actually do feel really good on a plant-based diet. Those are probably like, I don't know, the, the, the rich roles out there who do just fine on it. And then others just get kind of screwed. But anyways, that, that might be a discussion for another day. Cause uh, today, even though I, we, I do want to talk about nutrition and why you call your family, the fat field family and how your kids eat and everything. Uh, but first I'd love to hear about what exactly the, the fat field family is like, how, how that actually come to be. Oh yeah, man. So obviously, you know, when, when I started the ketogenic diet, I I've always been into like nutrition and I played college football. I started off as a strength and conditioning coach in college um, but this, this keto thing sounded absurd to me. And, um, but I was at a time where I had just dieted and I, I was open to trying something new and I just felt awesome. And so my wife joins me on everything we do. When we started paleo back in 2011, you know, she was with me and, you know, I really just felt like, especially where I was and, and where I am now, my age, um, it just the, the best baseline for most of the year. And so what well, we we started to do what we always do, which is talk to people about it and, and share. And 
And then I started the Ketogenic Athlete podcast with Brian Williamson in 2016. And we were focusing on like the athletes, but obviously at home, we're just implementing everything we learn. And I think a lot of parents, um, they they come to this period where like they, they, they're getting healthy, they're feeling better, but there's like a disconnect. And then they realize at some point, oh crap, I gotta, I should do this with my kids. Why am I still buying them cereal? Why am I still, you know, feeding them the way I fed them before? Yeah. Um, and and a lot of people, we would just have conversations with them or whether we were having them over or just in passing these conversations. And they're, they were like, man, you should, you should talk about that. You should talk about how parents, whether, you know, you're starting off, which is obviously ideal because you don't have like any habits that you got to undo, um, or you, you're dealing with a preteen or someone older. Like, how does that conversation change? How do you get your family on board to this whole lifestyle, which as you know, is never just about nutrition or about fitness. It's about all of these things kind of working together, your parenting style, um, education, the unschooling, the the mindset aspect of it, getting your kids to understand, you know, maintaining that freedom and that autonomy that's so important to a child, but also helping them understand the whys behind certain things. And, and at times, um, you know, limiting the options because listen, at this point, you don't know any better. And that's obviously, yeah. we've evolved there because we we used to be over the top, like radical unschoolers. And then we realized it was too much, too little um, structure. And and there has to be a little bit more of a definition between like, you know, what, who's who's the, the authority and who's not, because, you know, it's something that we naturally do, where we, well, obviously, we do it a little bit too much where we trust the authorities, but we should if we have a, a relationship with our children where where we've built their trust, we're honest with them, they should be able to trust us. But we have to first kind of establish that. And and because kids don't know, they, yeah. they don't they, they're just like, I want this food, you know, like I, yeah, it uh, tastes good. Why, why can't I have it? Obviously, human beings will, will err towards the universe itself and nature will err towards entropy and, and chaos without a little bit of structure yeah. and organization. And we're the same way with our unschooling process. We do, as as unschooling would dictate, allow our our sons to follow their passions and their interests and desire, and try to to formulate an environment that allows them to do that. But yet, there is some structure. You know, for example, this morning they had a, a mathnasium class at I think ten a.m. and they had a meeting with the the educational coordinator who we work with online at eleven, and then you know there there are certain other elements. You know, they have they have a Kamana workbook. They'll be out in nature later on this afternoon, going through their their Tom Brown wilderness style course. And, and it's not as nice. though they wake up and it's just a free day to choose whatever they want to do. There is still structure. There is still timing. There, there still are things scheduled. There's still even like the 12 core subjects that Washington state requires us to demonstrate core proficiency in that we, we have to, you know, put into spreadsheets and journals. And so a lot of people, I think <laughs> yeah. unschooling, think unschooling just involves like your kids outside barefoot in the dirt all day. I don't know, shooting bows at squirrels, shooting arrows at squirrels, but it is it is a, a little bit more structured than I think what most people would think. I think the the lack of structure though is in that it's going to be different from child to child based on their passions and their interests and desires. But then structure is built around that. So it's so it's more of the absence of a cookie cutter approach rather than the absence of structure and organization. You know. Yeah, it's funny because people the the initial thought is that unschooling is unparenting. And and they think, oh, I'd love to do that. But I just I just it's almost like a, like a humble brag, like, oh, I, I, you know, I can't I can't leave that much to to like to chance. And it's like, wait a second. I don't think you understand the commitment that it takes as a parent. Like you have to know your child better than they know themselves, like the amount of observation for for you to be able to like. And then obviously the flexibility to be to for both the child and the parent to be able to admit that you know what, we thought that this was going to be a passion or we thought that this was going to be something that we can really throw ourselves into, but either they've conquered it and, and lost interest and they're, now they're going on to something else, or it was not, it, it, you know, initially maybe they thought they liked it for certain reasons, but then they realized that the process is not something that they would enjoy. But it's so natural, um, like you get this child and obviously not not every parent, because a lot of parents wised up after 2020 and they started to take their kids out of school. Not all of them are coming with this like pristine, 
you know, blank slate like we had, you know, right. where we were doing all the research before they were even born, you know, and and so like there has to be I can't speak to that experientially, but I can say that um, there, it's it's totally fine to be able to say, you know what, either you know, we were wrong because we do that in our own lives. You know, how many of us, we, we went to college and no one asked what we wanted to do. It was like, what do you want right. to study? Right. That yeah, doesn't even make sense. Right. Like, and so, um, a lot of us had to figure that out, but we didn't have the tools or the experience as a child where they're just these sponges in there and they're, and it's so fun and learning hasn't, they haven't gotten jaded about learning and, and they're just like, you know, like John Taylor Gatto says, like genius is as common as common as dirt, you know, like. Yeah. John, John Taylor Gatto got great author, by the way, the underground history of American education and, uh, oh, yeah. weapons of mass destruction. Like, and, yeah. and, and another one, he is, uh, dumbing us down. He has some great, dumbing us down. Yeah. great books. I, I highly recommend anyone who wants to, to, uh, take charge of their child's education should look at, at Gatto's work. Now, uh, back, back to the, the keto thing, not, not to spend our, our entire discussion talking about feeding your kids sticks of butter, but you know, you, you start up <laughs> this fat fueled family. And I guess it begs the question. I'm sure other people are wondering if I am like, how do your kids actually eat? Are they also, you know, cause I interviewed Brian Johnson, right? The liver King and his kids actually do have like raw liver and bone marrow. I think with all their meals of the day, I'm, I'm curious, like, how do your children eat? I, I think a lot of people would love to hear like a few sample meals that, that you feed them or that they feed themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, like we don't, we don't focus on keto or, you know, we basically with them, like it started off really early. Like we, we weaned them both. My wife um, nursed them both for a year and a half for the first one, because he wanted, he was eating steak. Like he was like grabbing for the steak, like at six months, like he was just such a monster. Um, my second one, it was like two years and four months, and he was just so attached to her. But we weaned them both with with raw liver and soft boiled egg yolks. That's what that's what the original foods that they had, and you would see it. They'd eat it up. They had like a huge hmm. mess on themselves. Um, and you know, both of them actually the first one a little bit more because we started to get that second child syndrome. Yeah, I got, like, I got to ask by the way, how how old were they when you started giving your kids liver and, and egg yolks? Um, I would say anywhere from like eight months to like a year. Yeah. Right. I, if I got this right, this is why I wish Mauda was here. Cause she remembers these little details better, but I, re- uh, that's all right. But pr- pr- pretty young. And, and I'm, I'm sure that some nutritionists and, you know, folks who are, are dyed in the wool, you know, USDA food plate or food pyramid enthusiasts would claim that you might be risking like a parasitic infection or something like that. Feeding your kids raw liver. Like, were you guys concerned about that at all? Or were, were you looking at the sourcing of the liver or did that ever cross your mind? 100%. Yeah. The, the sourcing was like everything that I had read. We, we came, we started with paleo, but then we moved more to, um, to Weston A. Price, which for us mm-hmm. and with the kids is, for the most part is really how we do things with them. Yeah. Um, obviously there's lots of times when they're, they're probably in ketosis and, and they, well, I, I want to do a better job of this because of what I've learned with leptin the last, you know, year or so um, of like having like more concrete, you know, feeding times to really help establish their circadian biology. But I mean, they're so insulin sensitive. They're both really lean and really active. They yeah. spend a lot of time outside. So I'm not as concerned, but like, Generally speaking, they'll start their mornings with like always eggs and maybe turkey sausage. Um, and then they also like they're, they've been crushing paleo pancakes lately. Like my my wife makes them with like it's like banana and um, it's very like it's like two or three ingredients. I forget what's in there. And um, and then for lunch, you know, they'll have um, Desmond is my oldest. He's 11 and, and my youngest, Dean, is is eight. And. Desmond is like me, you know, like if you tell him something's healthy, he's really excited to eat it. Like he doesn't care what it is. He'll try it. it you know, even if he he'll pretend he likes it because he, he knows it's healthy. That's kind of how I am. I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of liver, but I'll mm-hmm. throw it in the burgers and stuff. Um, and so he'll take like peppers to school and eat them like an apple, you know, like with with, you know, and avocados and and turkey and cheese roll ups and and things like that like where it's I, I i hate to say school but it's it's the only thing that we can it's the only way we can describe when when and i'm sure we'll get into this like 
what it is they do at Urban Cottage. Yeah, yeah, I definitely um, want to hear more about Urban Cottage once, once we get off the nutrition bandwagon for sure. Yeah, but you, you brought up leptin dysregulation. I think that's important. A lot of a lot of parents, I think, are unaware of this concept, like like the role of leptin, the hormone. It, it's, it's a hormone secreted by fat cells, but it, it plays such a key role in energy homeostasis. And a lot of people would associate leptin uh, deficiencies or abnormalities to be something that you might have in, in an obesogenic individual. But kids who have leptin dysregulation, you see low bone density, you see like sugar cravings, you see low immune yeah. function, you see like staving off of puberty, like like late puberty. And, you know, I, I think people who aren't familiar with leptin, you know, just the broad overview is not enough sleep, like poor circadian rhythmicity in a child, uh, too much stress, yeah. and then too much of the wrong foods, particularly high sugar foods that are fed at the wrong times or constant snacking throughout the day, all results in this type of leptin dysregulation. I think it, it, it flies under the radar as far as a lot of the 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 causal incidents for the health problems that that kids have in adolescence, like a lot of it, can be tied back to leptin. So I'm I'm glad you brought that up. I, I know we didn't yeah. talk about it too much in the book itself, but it's such an important hormone to to pay attention to it. And, and interestingly, this is this is something that you might be familiar with from Dr. Jack Cruz, Danny. This idea oh, yeah. of of cold exposure for kids, like like having yeah. your kids do cold showers. Cold baths, play, you know, go outside in the snow. My kids used to go out in their underwear and do do snow angels as a dare, you know, before they'd they'd start their school for the day. And having a kid get used to temperature uh, hormetic stressors, both heat and cold, but particularly cold, can do a really really good job at keeping them leptin sensitive. So it's not just adults who benefit from from this type of focus on leptin regulation. Oh yeah, and and I mean the other the other benefit of the cold exposure besides obviously like you know the beijing of the you know brown you know kind of beijing of your fat cells, but it's also like it increases at least transiently adiponectin, which is another one like low adiponectin and high leptin are both like in and of themselves, like risk factors. So um, yeah. we've always like from a nutrition standpoint, like we, we, we've been beating this drum of like, it's hard because like a lot of people, they come into it at a certain point, but like, if you can, if you're young enough, or if you know, you're in between children Get yourself right because, you know, get your nutrition on point, like really focus on, you know, all these these, these really naturally high bioavailable B vitamin foods, like namely, you know, beef, grass fed, you know, or ruminant meat. And because the leptin, you know, that leptin resistance that that an adult has that can get passed on to the child and and that initial huge, I think while the child is in the womb, um, if I remember this correctly, like leptin is is causing them to to eat more and be well fed but it's there's like a switch at birth where that initial surge of leptin kind of sets up their life you know um and so like if you if if those things are dysfunctional when the baby's born it's automatically gonna it's just gonna be harder for them yeah. throughout life so i guess this whole conversation was was about i I've, I've changed in the way because I, I, I realize there's there's other benefits to eating meals together, which Friday we always do. Um, but like there's there's always things going on. There's jujitsu. There's there's, you know, playing outside where I don't even know where my kids are um, half the time, especially in the summer. And so now I, I do like the idea, which kind of goes into the importance of routines and schedules, which we do have. So it's not like we were completely doing something different. It's just bringing a little bit more structure on the nutrition side to where not only are their days predictable mentally for them, so they know their, their expectations, but at the same time, you know, um, just, just biologically eating predictable feeding times, like there's something to be said about having a good old 6 a.m., 7 a.m. breakfast, 12 p.m. lunch, and 6, 7 p.m. dinner where the body is just less stressed. It, it has predictability. Um, and, you know, I know that with the keto community where I, I'm always having to like, guys, guys, wait, there's this too. I mean, you, mm -hmm. intermittent fasting is great, but it's like, what, what is your state? Like, generally speaking, we are way overstressed and, and everybody's skipping breakfast, which to me, I'm beating that drum. Like, get your food. That's when leptin's lowest. Get your food in in the morning. Yeah. Lean, active individuals. I mean, it's been shown that that breakfast skipping, frequent breakfast skipping, and excessive intermittent fasting results in a lot of adrenal dysregulation, which especially for kids is a problem. Yep. I think I, I have had some friends, probably the most notable uh, 
Dan Pompa, who's a, a well-known kind of like fasting yeah. enthusiast and, and detoxification Pompa, yeah. expert, he he uh, and his wife do a lot of fasting, and their kids also did quite a bit of fasting. But from what I understand with them, like like a big reason for that was because some of their kids had gotten overweight, and so they they used mm. it as a, as a weight loss tool for their kids. But but just because that whole idea of you know longevity enhancing twelve to sixteen hour intermittent fast seems to work well in some adults in both lean adults and in lean children, like a lot of times the, the cons outweigh the pros, especially if someone's not eating adequate calories later on in the day. Like I run into a lot of people who have issues with like bone density and hormonal dysregulation, a lot of issues due to excessive fasting. So it kind of depends on who you are. You know, a lot of these fasting studies have been done yeah. to people who are, who are not just normal weight, but, but overweight or high body fat, not to the, you know, like lean CrossFitters who sometimes are shooting themselves in the foot with too much of that, you know, yeah. much less children. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, like you said, it's like people who are already relatively lean for them, these, this, it's going to be a point of diminishing returns that happens much, much quicker. And it's great. Like try it out, do it. You know, I, I tend to on my day off, which Saturday we do the Sabbath, you know, like, um, I tend to just naturally fast that day, but, but overall, especially a growing child where, you know, you asked about one of our like kind of cornerstones is, you know, protein is the animal protein is basically the the cornerstone. It's the most important when, when the children are eating, it's like eat your food first, which is like the meat. And then you can eat your other stuff after like the rice or the or the, the veggies or the fruit that you're eating. Um, and we have our non-negotiables, which, you know, for the most part, we stick to, which is like you know, we, we really minimize grains, but we, we do bring in some grains, but we, we usually minimize them. We do a lot of sourdough as of like the last month. We're making sourdough everything, um, you know, no food dyes and um, and no no processed seed oils. And like it just so happens that that if you just buy real food, it's easy to stick to that. So when parents are like, should should I buy this or should I buy that? I'm like, that has that breaks all three of them. You know, it's like it's a high grain, you know, low quality um, protein like a soy. And it's like, you know, it has seed oils in it and it has food colorings. So like all those things, because we've seen the, the downside to it, like we can when your children usually eat healthy and they eat real food and you give them something like that, the you really have no background noise. So you're they're very sensitive to it. So it's like I can say this one's going to get eczema. This one's going to bleed from his nose. This one's going to like have, um, I lose eye contact when I get like, when there's like red 40, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So like those things are like, and obviously the, the medical community and just media and, and culture at large does not really put anywhere near the amount of importance behind like what those things can do even acutely, let alone chronically. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you brought up the Weston A. Price diet also. I'll, I'll link, if, if folks go to bengreenfieldlife.com slash vega, I'll link to the dietary guidelines for that. But it, it is different than like a strict paleo approach. Like there are whole grains, there's legumes, there's nuts, but it all involves soaking Bond and dairy. sprouting and leavening you oh, know, to yeah. neutralize a lot of the phytic acid and the enzyme inhibitors. You know, you, you see a lot of like ghee and, and lard and full fat raw cheeses as well. You know, many times you don't, you don't see dairy on a typical paleo type of diet and unlike a, a like a ketogenic diet i mean it allows for you know unpasteurized wine and beer obviously not in kids but in adults you know there, there's a, a great deal of some of these slightly higher carb uh foods you know like berries and grains and legumes and nuts that appear in it but i think it's a very well structured diet especially for the average person i think it's one of the best diets out there as a matter of fact most of the the women who I've helped with their their pregnancy diet. I'll I'll have them on it something very very close to that, and all these you know big gorgeous you know kids you know eight to ten pounds with with uh, you know nice you know teeth and and hair that grows in nicely. And that that Weston A. Price diet I think works really really well for for the lion's share of of parents and children, especially those who aren't restricting you know carbohydrates, for example. I've worked to achieve many things in life, but my greatest yet most humbling work, I think, has been with my role as a father. Parenting is blissful. It's brutal. It's far beyond anything I ever could have anticipated. My sons are now teenagers. And the people around us who engage with them often ask if I could write a book 
on raising children and education and legacy and discipline and all this stuff that goes into raising a good child, a good human. Now, I didn't feel that qualified to write a parenting guide. So I gathered a team of parenting superstars, dozens of my friends, entrepreneurs, authors, neurologists, psychologists, family coaches, a whole lot more. I got all their best tools, techniques, perspectives, habits on, again, everything from education to discipline to travel to rites of passage and beyond. And I put it all in one massive book that's like the guide to parenting. So it's now available. It's at BoundlessParentingBook.com, and that's where you can pre-order your copy today. So BoundlessParentingBook.com, it has been an absolute adventure putting this thing together. I think you're going to love it. I'm pretty stoked because this is now something I can do when I'm on the go. And it's based on this idea that the human body being mostly water. But what you probably don't know is everything else in your body is 50% amino acids. That means basically water and amino acids are two of the most important things that you can have in your body. And some amino acids are essential. You have to get them from food, from breaking down steak and chicken and eggs and everything else. But this stuff called Keon Aminos is a plant-based, full essential amino acids profile backed by over 20 years of clinical research with the highest quality ingredients, no fillers, no junk, rigorous quality testing, tastes amazing with all natural flavors. I got on the amino acids bandwagon way back when I was racing Ironman Triathlon. Started with branch chain amino acids, realized those were a waste of time, switched over to essential amino acids, and it has been a game changer ever since. Now, what did I mean when I said travel? Well, these Keon aminos, which are the essential amino acids that I take, they have for the watermelon flavor, the lemon lime flavor, the berry flavor, and uh, the mango flavor. They got stick packs now. So you can take them on the go anywhere. I I honestly have like a couple packs of my fanny pack now. I can dump them in water when I'm at a restaurant. Have that instead of like a bread, a basket that comes out or a cocktail. They satiate the appetite. They accelerate recovery. They're amazing pre-workout or during a workout. The list goes on and on. Fact is, if you haven't tried essential amino acids, you're missing out. And you can save 20% now on any monthly deliveries and 10% on any one-time purchases. If you go to getkeon.com slash Ben. That's get K I O N dot com slash Ben to get my fundamental supplement for fitness. Keon Aminos, get K I O N dot com slash Ben. Now, we could obviously talk about nutrition till we're blue in the face, and you, you get into more of your guys' nutrition concepts in the book, but you also mentioned, and, and I'd love to, to kind of segue into this, this school that your kids oh, yeah. go to. I think you called it the Urban Cottage. Tell me about that. Oh man, I'm I'm just like so blessed to find this place. So we, like I said before, we started radical unschooling, you know, and obviously over time, you know, people as as a parent, you know, when you homeschool or unschool, you know, you got to deal with first your fears. So that's where the research comes in. John Taylor Gatto, um, a bunch of really good um, articles and books that we've read, and then like then the next thing is you got to prepare yourself for the for like your family and 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 that takes a little bit longer because you have you have no proof at that point when they're little and every time the child acts up they're like oh you see i told you and then they always act like you know they're going to turn on you like a pit bull natural like at some point um but we did we're we're able to learn and pivot and we we realized that we didn't have enough structure and uh here comes in 2019 um Christina Kirk a friend of ours she moves to town and um, is looking for a place because she needs to, you know, have some time to do content. And she's a writer um, and she finds this place and she tells Mauda about it. And um, it's called Urban Cottage. And this was in 2019. And so um, Marisa, she's the the owner. It's like this little house and very much completely in line with us um, as far as educational philosophy, um, but with a with a much more. Um, just robust background in like pedagogy and, and like the actual um, cause, cause, you know, I used to be like, well, any parent can, can, can homeschool their child. And, and like, to some extent, I still believe that, but you know, there's, it's an investment in, you know, you have to learn, you have to research, you, you know, you can't just, it's not that you're unqualified, but just like anything in life that, that doesn't require school, you have to learn and, you know, we did a lot of the parts that we liked, but there were certain things that we didn't. And we had 
certain things with unschooling that are still in place where generally speaking at urban cottage they're probably 70 to 80 percent of the time in their sweet spot which is you know what what they're really what really makes them like their eyes twinkle but then there's still going to be that attention paid to all right like you are like your reading needs to be better your writing is is kind of sloppy you know you're we're, we're and then there's obviously there's there's kind of a, a loose agenda like there's we're right now we're doing history we're doing um well they're always doing history actually but you know last year the, i think the the big focus was like on egypt and or this year's on egypt and last year was a lot on on you know the american history and mm-hmm. world the, the wars and civil war but like urban cottage so marisa she's she's very much like she's very montessorian and hopefully she doesn't get mad at me if she listens to this like about me pigeonholing her because she's just she was a teacher and she had a lot of passion and she homeschooled and she just had this idea to start this place. There's never more than five children um, in that place. Um, you know, they take their shoes off when they go in there. It's a you know, the the environment is very Montessorian as far as like mm-hmm. having that really good like um, just the setting them up for success. And yeah, giving Mont- them Mont- Montessorian, by the way, just just a, a quick explanation for people. Oh yeah, it, it emphasizes a lot of free physical activity, like like uh, you know just basically mind body awareness, a lot of informal instruction and individual instruction, rather than everybody learning at the same pace as the rest of the classroom. Typically, a really good early emphasis on writing and reading, right? Expression of thoughts and the ability yeah. to to rapidly assimilate information. And then a lot of sensory motor training. So, so people throw that term around sometimes. I think some people might not understand what it means. But those are those are the basic principles of the Montessori method. And it sounds like that's what the Urban College is kind of following. Yeah, and you know, I think I think a lot of children like we 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 keep as parents trying to like. I remember when they were younger, we already knew like flashy toys, toys that have that are like basically just crush the imagination, whether they're making noises or they already have sounds or the characters already like well defined where you can't use your imagination. Like we knew that was wrong, but, but for the most part, we were like, it's interesting. Children are just so imaginative and like you give them these toys and they're like, I want to play with your phone. You know, I want to play with this box. And I think the Montessori and like like Montessori is very much they they understand that like let's give them some some smaller you know plastic knives or whatever you know um, uh, bamboo knives and and let's let's let them do these things they want to do them they want the responsibility and it does develop their motor skills um, but they're they just she's also Christian which obviously that doesn't um, exclude anyone. Because there are all types of people that go there, but she's just amazing in the sense that number one, every time we pick them up, whoever's like the facilitator at the time, which they're all very highly qualified. Um, they came from like some of the best schools, and and they say this is ten times better than than what I did, and they, they get paid well, which is which is important. Um, but they give us a review of like what's 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 going on for this week. There's always a printout of like what we're doing this week, what you can practice at home. And we have regular um, meetings. We have um, there's a therapist, a licensed therapist that can can diagnose things and can evaluate things um, that we we have, you know, from time to time. And then we also have book club where, uh, as it should be, parents are invested and will read like um last boy in the woods or we'll read you know things that about the importance of outside play or or, mm-hmm. or, or or interesting conversations that get all types of parents from different lifestyles to talk about subjects and which is just kind of like a pet thing of hers as well because you know we've lost the ability to have a dialogue where everything is just so red or blue you know blue pill or red pill this or that and it's like People don't understand that that's not how life is. And we need to be able to, you know, I guess this is a good segue if we want to talk about it, like, you know, the trivium and the quadrivium, you know, like. Yeah, like, I, I noticed that you did talk about the trivium and the quadrivium in the book when you began to discuss some of the failures of modern education, how you, how you felt that it was a form of, you know, indoctrination. But uh, some people might not also be familiar with this idea of the trivium and the quadrivium. Can you get into that? 
Yeah, so like the the trivium stands, you know, obviously tree tree tress um, is is a threefold discovery methodology. It's it's how we discover truth. You know, we have grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So grammar is kind of like the the information gathering, which is which is what most school is. You know, it's which is indoctrination. It's like know these facts, right? But it it misses that that processing. Um, that processing part, which is logic, you know, like we need to we need to understand and have like open conversations about how do I read that versus how do you read that? I mean, if I read a Bible verse, Ben, and you read a Bible verse, like you'll get something and I'll get another thing. And, you know, like the Jews call that midrashing, which is super cool. Like we're very much Greek where it's like the instructor, like it's that Western, you know, education that that the instructor's telling you what to learn. But you know, having the the ability to, to to have the knowledge, the understanding with which the logic is, and then the wisdom, which is the rhetoric. The, the 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 rhetoric is like how how am I able to defend what I what I know? And if you think about it, if you miss out on any part of that, you know, the second one you can't do as well. If you if well, the third one you can't do as well as if you don't have the second one. You're not going to be able to defend. Um, you know, the knowledge that you have if you don't spend time understanding. Whereas like in the typical education, we have these like just completely arbitrary, you know, um, guidelines and, and milestones where they need to do this by this age and this by this age. And, and you know, you're basically it's the idea of like, what does a school do? You know, a school of fish like you, you can't have you can't be too out in the front. You can't be too far in the back. And like, you know, it's it's without even getting into the the ethical part of it just just like the overall utilitarian side of this like how is this going to work it's a management system and you're just the best you're going to be able to do is manage people there will be people that thrive in that but mm -hmm. like you said like you know like you said there are people like like rich roll that that do great with vegan diets but that's not everybody and you know um the whole idea of having this education, it's like, well, I got to work and I got to work. But as a parent, we're very much, you know, we are committed to this lifestyle and to be committed to this lifestyle. There's there's certain sacrifices that we make because like they're only a child once that that developed all these different developmental stages. You, if you have this in place, your child becomes just, first of all, like. Um, they won't be deceived. They'll mm -hmm. be able to make good, good decisions. They'll be able to make mistakes and they will make mistakes. That's the other thing that people are afraid of is, is, you know, danger or mistakes, yeah. but that's the, that's the trivia. And, and I think it's, it's so important. So just, just real quick to summarize for people who, who, uh, made a quick summary that the trivium is basically a threefold process. It's, it's grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And typically yep. the, the grammar is the knowledge component. The logic is the understanding component and the rhetoric is the wisdom component. So uh, using modern terms, we might classify that as basically input, meaning the knowledge and the grammar processing, meaning the understanding, the logic, and then output, meaning the wisdom and the rhetoric. So essentially you're, you're creating an information filtering and dissemination process that allows, you know, this is very similar to like Naval Ravikant's idea behind education that, that, you know, a well-rounded education that sets someone up for success anywhere in life would include yes. some element of writing, the ability to clearly express one's thoughts, reading, the ability to be able to, to digest and understand information and then, uh, rhetoric, the ability to be able to express oneself. And I, I think he classifies rhetoric as also persuasion, right? The ability to make a case yeah. or argue for something that you that you want to make a case for. Now, uh, Naval also highlights the importance of logic and or computer programming, which is just basically logic applied to technology. And then uh, the the final one is is arithmetic, right? Like like basic uh, processing of of numbers and quantities. Now, the the quadrivium is is the other component of like this classical education approach and. Want to understand the quadrivium is uh, what is it? Arithmetic. Um, what are the other three? Geometry. Geometry. Yep. And music and astronomy. Music and astronomy. <laughs> okay. So so yeah. Naval Ravikant says uh, arithmetic would be one, and like I mentioned, uh, logic or computer programming 
would be another, but it sounds like the quadrivium says arithmetic and rather than logical computer programming lists, uh, geometry, music, and astronomy. So basically that that's kind of like the, the quantification aspect or understanding the universe, like the science of the universe is split into in the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And then that's paired with the trivium, the, the grammar, the logic and the rhetoric. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, to, to, to have logic, to have understanding, um, the the way logic, quote unquote, logic is applied now is is all subjective. If you notice, like not all, but I hate to make you know generalizations, but most of it is is just here is the our subjective understanding, and here is the explanation for this. Here's why this is happening, which you know confounds like you know effects with with causes, um, and you know it's 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 full of of um what's the word um fallacies Mm -hmm. whereas you know if you if you're looking at you know how do we apply logic like how are we things there's natural laws and and you know quantity there's no subjectivity like in quantity you know like you'll have um and then geometry is kind of like that um the 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 shape size and proportion you know um spatial stuff and then, of course, you have um, music, which is vibration, you know, like thermodynamics, you know, like mm-hmm. understanding how arithmetic goes through time. And then, of, of course, astronomy, which is why you mentioned how everything It's interesting, how there's so many scientific principles that completely fly in the face of, of modern science. Like everything is naturally like the second law of thermodynamics, you know, like everything just um, leans towards um uh, entropy, but and 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 I and I believe that to be true with human beings in general. I believe that back then, because of we were less degenerated, uh, humans were just better built. You know, our minds worked better, and we focused on these what what we call the seven lost arts, which is the trivium and the quadrivium. Mm-hmm. And you know, having the um, ability to understand like like the, the the heavens, you know, the the stars, the arithmetic of 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 space of time and space you know it's it's honestly it's so cool because you know it literally is like a clock up there and you know children you know you want to get a child just like lit up like i have a nikon p900 like look for stars you know and see what stars actually are how they actually look they look like these vibrating orbs in like some sort of liquid medium it's 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 amazing and it also helps us with signs and seasons which obviously the bible says is we're able to predict, you know, the next eclipse. We're able to. These are all. It's like it's it's like clockwork. It's a, it's a, it's a perfect design. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's, it's always it's always puzzled me why they don't just put the quadrivium and the trivium together and just call it like the the septivium or something like that. But those those really are the <laughs> the the seven yeah. basic uh, tenets of a, uh, a a well formulated liberal arts education. As a matter of fact, both of my sons have expressed interest in attending a liberal arts institution up here in Idaho called New St. Andrews College. And although I'm disillusioned with with many forms of modern university education, I've given them the, the green light thumbs up on that because, again, like I feel if they did want to go and do coursework after high school, studying those seven subjects prepares one for success in law, in medicine, in art, in writing, and in, in any uh, career that they want to pursue. It simply helps to create a well-rounded human. And, and there's, of course, you don't have to wait until a liberal arts education in college to get there. You can weave this stuff into a high school or a junior high or even a, a K through six type of curriculum. If you are unschooling or homeschooling, I should note that I think a couple of the, the better resources out there for learning about the type of books and curriculums that could exist that could be woven in or one book called uh, unschooling to university i think mean, that's a fantastic manual that goes well, all the way from, read from k up to college oh man it's good it's, and it's relatively new it's only a couple of years old i interviewed the author uh, a few years ago uh when, when the book first came out and i'll, I'll link to that at bengreenfieldlife.com slash vega that that interview and also the book but then also uh, John Holt uh, has a wonderful, oh, wonderful yeah, John Holt. That's list of resources on yeah homeschooling and unschooling. That, that's John Holt, GWS.com. I'll link to that one in the show notes as well. And so, yeah, it, it sounds like you're doing a lot of right stuff. This, this Urban Cottage sounds fascinating. I may have to go check out their website and, and see some more of what they're doing. I, I wanted to also ask you about uh, discipline because this is something yeah. that you cover a little bit in the book. I think you guys 
have an interesting approach to discipline. So, so tell me a little bit more about discipline, whether you guys did, uh, did spanking or, or some other form of discipline. Yeah. So we started off like just hardcore, you know, anti all of that, you know, we were like, you know, this doesn't, it doesn't do anything. And it was way too, it was idealistic to be honest. You know, it was not reality based. It was, um, you know, it was kind of something that we're always talking about on the mindset side, which is like our perception was how we wanted things to be, but not really how they, how they are. Um, and so, um, we started off with like, it was very little discipline. Um, and you know, with the first one, he just naturally responded to the whole idea of living in partnership as, as, you know, parents and and the child were like okay we're building trust you know and mm-hmm. and it's very woo woo stuff and and honestly like i don't really agree with it anymore but um we we just were we were thinking about um the what does spanking do to the brain and and you know all all the stuff that we learned about that you know it decreases brain matter and and how you know it Wait, you said spanking decreases brain matter yeah, there's actually, there's actually, really? yeah, there's, um, you know what, I'll, I'll make a note to see, cause my, my wife knows that one, but it's basically, it, it decreases gray matter. Um, hmm. and I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll look for that so I can give that to you. And also by That's the way, wooden books for the trivium and the quadrivium. Mm-hmm. Um, I would re- also recommend wooden books. Um, wooden those, books. Those yep. There, okay. There's, I think it's all one word. There's one of each and we, we have those, um, but um, yeah, let me. I'm writing a note on yeah, that. See, so, anyways, see, I've, I've seen some research that like trauma and child abuse may lead to alterations in neural tissue and a loss of gray matter. I'm not. I'm not sure how closely that extends to uh, a, a clear and defined discipline for something that 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 a that a child has done. That's obviously. You know, well, for us, at least when we spanked, it would be when our child was doing something that could potentially put their life or their health at serious risk yeah. or something that they were repeatedly engaged in that they obviously were not getting the message via consequential based parenting or some other form of discipline uh, that this was wrong or could harm them in the future. And we, we've probably spanked our children. Gosh, they're 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 fourteen, and I don't think we'd we'd really spank them at all at this point. But I I would say probably I could count on both hands, maybe like ten times or less that we've ever actually spanked our children. We we tend to use consequential based parenting, but I think there's a time yes. and a place to like slap a child's hand if they keep on going towards the hot stove or something like that. And I, I would doubt that that would cause a reduction in gray matter versus like emotional neglect or physical abuse. But it, it'd be interesting to see the data on that. Well, you know what? Um, and this is this is I think we we mentioned it when we answered that question in the book about how, you know, we were generally my wife and I, you get us both together. We're naturally very rebellious, very libertarian. And um, we had to reconcile that with our beliefs, you know, and mm-hmm. we realized that, you know, I had a friend who's a pastor who's he's a chaplain for the Dolphins. He's a great guy. He spanks his child. He does it the right way. And and we did actually bring in some spanking later on, especially with the younger one. Um, and it seemed to m- be much better. But like you said, in the right context, not out of anger. And maybe we were reading into and I just <laughs> took my wife's word for it when she's like, you know, spanking decreases gray matter. Maybe she was conflating, you know, spanking the child with like all out abuse, which which could totally be the case, like you said. Um, but like I said, in um, and, and both of us, we we when we answered this was we realized that, it, you know, adding really just focusing in on a biblical approach where in general, like do anything that you do needs to be grounded in really good principles. We started to see certain things where, like I said, bad perception. Um, so we, we basically added an emphasis on God's law, because if you're teaching your child about natural law, natural law is God's law. Science is God's law. Um, you know, for example, highlighting the fifth commandment, it, it, it says, honor your parents, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and then I, <laughs> in Deuteronomy 28, I've, I, you know, I've, I've read this over and over to them. It's really, um, obviously I, I get theatrical with it when I read it. And it's, it's funny because it's all like, you know, if you follow these commandments, you know, you'll be blessed in the field. You'll be your oxen, your, the, the, the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your trees, you know, like you'll, you'll, you'll never owe someone. You'll always be the lender. You'll, you'll be the head and not the tail. 
And, you know, everything, every, your enemies, you know, they'll come running one way at you and they'll run away seven ways from you. But if you don't, and it literally talks about the curses. And um, those are things that aren't even in my control. They're, they're natural laws that if you're not obeying your parents, you're not honoring your parents. Um, and and it's it's definitely if someone is listening to this and, and is like me, who is just very libertarian minded, um, I would ask you know, to, to, to examine that a little bit and examine yeah. your beliefs well, and, you know, cause yeah, that, I, I think that a lot of the concepts that you'd find in, in the 10 commandments, for example, that are often misinterpreted as, you know, silly rules from, from on high, they actually lend themselves to a great deal of societal stability, right? Whether that be yeah. uh, monogamy or honoring one's father and mother or not stealing or taking something that doesn't belong to you. You know, th there's a reason that I think our, our forefathers were very wise in founding this country upon some semblance of these Judeo-Christian principles. Because again, like, let's, let's take the the fifth commandment, for example, uh, you know, the, the, this idea of honoring your father and mother, well, there's a pretty distinct connection between honoring parents and maintaining uh, civilization, right? So, yeah. uh, so you know, for example, we know that fatherless boys, right, they're more likely to grow up and commit violent crime and mistreat women and act out against society. We know that that girls who don't have a father to honor or to or to love, they're more likely to seek the wrong men or to be promiscuous at an early age, which can, of course, lend itself to uh, things such as you know abortion or or fatherless children. And I, I think the the other thing to think about is that if, if you look at a lot of like totalitarian movements, one of the first things they do is they try to break the child-parent bond to shift the child's allegiance yeah, from the yeah. parents to the state. And that tends to usurp the parent's role and also result in, in the ability for more totalitarian governmental control. And then finally, when, when you look at the issue of you know, things like uh, like hospice, uh, the way that old people are cared for, the way that we dishonor elders in our society, the way that traditions are lost and legacy is lost. A great deal of that comes down to not honoring one's parents. And so what you, you, you look at these laws, then you start to investigate how they produce these tendrils that extend into multiple aspects of societal stability. And the light bulb goes off. And you're like, oh, these are actually some pretty good rules for running society in general. You know, and I, I think that that the the Israelites were a perfect example of you know how that did create a great deal of success for them to have these you know the, these laws of absolute morality and you know I, I think that's one of the reasons that that America became great is by being founded on these principles and so you know when when you hear something like honor your father and mother there's a lot more to it than just like being nice to your parents like it, it's pretty important for for society and legacy as a whole. Yeah, and and not to mention like anything else in your in your lifestyle like eating the right way so your child can eat the right way you're modeling what you want for them you know right. you're modeling this 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 stable family structure that's that that a, a developing child that needs stability and needs nurturing and needs discipline you're modeling that for them so that they can continue to pass that through their genes um, and pass that through their actions so yeah it's like i think a lot of it is just like our typical you know kind of postmodern culture, which everything is like, you know, question everything. And, and, and I, I question everything I do, mm -hmm. but at the same time, like you, you look at even evidentially, like you said, I don't know if you ever heard of Alice Bailey's 10 point plan, um, no. but she's like a big new age person, like from the thirties. And it was like, literally everything that's happening now is, is that, and, and it, it tends to like always lead it, like lend itself to, mind control and you know warped views and 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 uh, a, a a perception and a view of life and a just a, a way of being that that is much more pliable to others and less you know individually like independent and um and honestly like effective you know and 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 um capable in in different areas of life because yeah. it's it's like so yeah, I, I, but in, in general, like I'm, I'm with you, man. Like I, I, I definitely consequences. I think are huge. It's like you know, if 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 I have, you know, it's just, it's the same way we say like you know, sharing. We don't force them to share because that's forced sharing. That doesn't make sense. Or or like if if we teach them that their bodies are their own. You know, like your body is yours. If you don't want to kiss grandma today, you're not in the mood. I'm not gonna say go kiss grandma. 
Mm-hmm. And grandma's going to get mad about that. I get it. But at the same time, like, you know, you you want grandma, you want my child to be able to, especially if it's a, a girl, which we have boys, but still like your body's yours. You mm-hmm. want them to to know that their body is theirs. And, you know, you want them to have a strong sense of, of property rights. Like this is my property. And, and children tend to be a lot more graspy when they're afraid that their parents are going to take their toy away and give it to Johnny because Johnny wants his turn or um, the whole idea that like, well, Johnny's not sharing with me and now I need to go find the authority figure to make them share with me. I mean, yeah. how does that play out as in adulthood? Like we've seen it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, now in, in the time that we have left, I would love to visit rites of passage. This is another section that you talk oh, about yeah. in the books. So what rites of passage or, or I guess significant moments of maturation to adolescence or adulthood did any of your children experience? How did you weave that in if you did? Well, we definitely have like, um, I, I talk about the importance of like, it's not zero to a hundred. Like you have to have increasing difficulty, increasing um, independence and, and responsibility for the child. So, you know, we do boppy days, like our next boppy day is going to be really fun. It's going to be both my sons with me where we're going to, we're just going to go ride go-karts, you know? Um, but we will do hikes. And, you know, one of the things that I had, um, years ago, probably like five, six years ago, he was like five or six Desmond. Um, my oldest, he was the original. And then I actually, um, he, he was, we were walking through, we were hiking and I, I heard him behind me telling his brother and teaching his brother, you know, cause when it gets hard, you know, the natural inclination is just to, to quit or just I'm bored. I want to, I want to go home. I let's go eat some ice cream, you know, whatever. And so, um, I, this was not hard for me to do because I have a terrible sense of direction. I was like, we went hiking with the goal of getting lost. And because I knew that it would be it would be hot, it would be harder for him. And that's when I heard him starting to huff and puff and starting to, <laughs> you know, him and ha and and um, mm-hmm. and 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 then I was like, now is the time um, I, I said I did this on purpose. OK, now is the time where you have to think about there's times when things are going to get hard. And what are you going to tell yourself? You know, because your mind is going to say, I can't believe this and get get into this like crazy pattern of like victimhood or just not problem solving and not addressing the actual issue. Um, and so develop a mantra. And I heard him like behind me and he was just like kind of trying things out. And he finally he's changed his mantra since then. But like because he says it's dumb now, but <laughs> he was like, you can do this. Nobody's better than you, you know. And and so things like that, you know, I, I got Desmond when he turned nine, he, he went to like two gun safety courses where like they were each like two to three hours and he shot like a hundred rounds. So, you know, um, shooting a 22 handgun, shooting a nine millimeter, shooting a 22 rifle. He now has a 22 rifle. Um, and, um, and so increasing the, and we do all types of stuff outside. Like we, we made a raised garden bed and, he does the hoeing to, to to take out the grass and we put in the dirt. His he's an amazing horticulturalist. Like he's at Urban Cottage. Like his plants and his you know fruits and vegetables. Like out of all of them, they 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 live the longest. They actually um, you know the person who does because now there's a there's a forest school aspect to it which I didn't mention. But there's um, like two three days away they have forest uh, a week they have forest school where they're they're doing stuff outside and all of these things have to build up to a point where I mentioned in the book how the a book that was really transformative for me, which was Wild at Heart. Um, yeah. by, um, great book, great, uh, great ministry, great website, great resources. John Eldridge. John Eldridge. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So like every man has that question, you know, do I have what it takes to be a man? And you have three boys, right? Two boys, twin boys, 14 years old. Two boys, two boys. Yeah. Well, I, by the way, I, 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 may, I failed to mention this. Like I got your raising superheroes, like little PDF, like 10 years ago. I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, nobody who talks about the importance of eating boogers, you know, like, it's like mm-hmm. all this like really cool stuff. But, but I'm like, I'm like, it's all, it's, it's really important because every man has that question, you know, like, do I have what it takes to be a man? And, you know, like if we don't have that father figure, we see it like in these, these cultures that are still connected to like the traditions and still connected to the land and to their food. They have these rites of passage and they're, they're never like giving it to them is not going to work. You can't just say you're a man now, son, 
because mm-hmm. even if he he agrees, he's subconsciously going to say, "I didn't really earn this." So you have to increase the responsibility um, over time and and make it a little bit more dangerous. Don't be afraid of things like we don't risk life or limb, but you know things that are more dangerous. Doing like survival type stuff, like they were in Cub Scouts, both of them. We did tons of camping um, and and increasing that because then when you say that then it's going to mean something. And and that's how you avoid that false self manifesting where it's either like you become the tough guy or you become the workaholic or the ladies man or the wimp. And right. all of these are just like a, a poor expression of your masculinity where, where the father's needed for that. And you have to like basically inculcate that and, um, and, and, and do those things. I think yeah. rites of passage are huge. Yeah. It sounds to me like, like you did from the learning how to shoot several types of firearms to uh to some of the the trips that you guys are going to be going on for hunting to you know the, these mantras that you did with your son on the difficult hike that you've kind of implemented almost like many rites of passages throughout their upbringing and i, I i've taken a little bit of a similar approach right like we we've got a our next one is is a free diving and spearfishing course that i have coming up with my sons for them to learn as you know a little inland you know, Washington and, and Idaho boys, you know, how to deal with water and depth and sharks and fish and darkness and kind <laughs> of the fear of the ocean. Uh, or, you know, for example, we've gone on, on multiple hunts together where they've harvested an animal or, you know, we'll be going down and doing uh, in a couple of months the the warrior weekend uh, in uh, near Encinitas, California, where we have a couple of days of almost like a miniature Navy SEAL hell week for fathers and sons. We've done the Father Son Wilderness oh, Survival cool. Camp. But then I think also, and this is something I think is important, we've we've woven in two distinctly ceremonial rites of passage. One rite of passage into adolescence, which they completed when they were 13, which was, you know, backpack, uh, wool blanket, knife, wilderness overseen by a wilderness survival instructor in which they were were given the opportunity to survive in the wilderness and face their fears. And they came out of that and there was a coming of age ceremony and a fire and a, and a, and a, you know, family and friends feast afterwards. And then the second distinctly ceremonial rite of passage that they'll do when they're 16 is something similar, another rite of passage in the wilderness, but it'll be longer, you know, five to seven days again, self-survival, you know, facing fears, being alone. And so I'm a fan of both, like identifying times of a child's life where you have the opportunity to foster their entry into adulthood and help them to face their fears and then actually having this this time where a child might know three or four years in advance, oh, when I, you know, when they're twelve, like, oh, when I'm sixteen, this is gonna be when my rite of passage occurs. I better be getting ready for that right now. You know, be a plant foraging and fire making and shelter building. And and I think that that both are good to weave in. But it's interesting that nearly every parent who I interviewed for this book has either kind of like the casual approach of just identifying times and opportunities to teach a child about what it means to be an adult and to put them through typically a hard scenario, a hard mental, physically difficult scenario to do that. Uh, Or these ceremonial rites of passages that are clearly identified as, Oh, Hey, you're an adolescent now, uh, in which in the case of us, they were given more responsibility in the home, more chores, you know, more, we began to call them, you know, young men instead of boys, et cetera. And then a rite of passage to adulthood after which they will be expected to contribute to the home's income, they will have two years before they're out of the house and not allowed to live in our house after that point. They'll be expected to, you know, have a job for themselves, et cetera. So they, and they know, like they've known since they were like 10 years old that that's what's coming down the pipeline. So we give them plenty of time to prepare. But I think that, that weaving these type of things intentionally into a child's upbringing is so, so important. Well, I mean, you, you think about the typical approach. The only real rite of passage is like getting your license, you know, yeah. or, right. you know, and, and like, you know, you go from Maybe a bar mitzvah for, for, for a girl, sometimes it's, it's her first period, you know, or, or, or onset of menstruation. But yeah, I, I think we can be a little bit more intentional than that in many cases. Well, I mean, yeah. Cause like you go from having to ask permission to go to the bathroom to, you know, either fighting in a war, God forbid, or, or like huh. deciding what to do with your life. Yeah. You know, you need to have that, that that stair step approach like you're doing. And a lot of it is fun, like processing a chicken. You know, my son did that when he was six, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, just, you know, dissecting animals, things like that, that uh, for boys, I know boys because, you know, God blessed me with two boys. I guess he didn't think I could handle girls. And I I guess I agree. Um, (laughs) And, and I know boys and I know what's important for them. And I think as a parent, we need to know 
specifically like what what each gender needs and how they can it's all you know like the the education you know it's it's that that um specific approach for each you know Mm -hmm. customized approach yeah yeah tailored approach yeah exactly well there's so much more that you get into in you and Moore's chapter in Boundless Parenting. I will, of course, link to the book, or you can go to boundlessparentingbook.com to check it out and hear more of Danny and Moore's responses to 31 different questions that I asked each of the, the dozens of parents that are featured within the book. But then I will also put uh, resources in the show notes to everything that Danny and I talked about today, including, you know, books like Unschooling to University, the Weston A. Price Dietary Guidelines, more information about leptin if you want to learn about that. We'll include some of the research on on spanking and gray matters, everything that you'd want to you'd want to hear or read more about. I'll put it bengreenfieldlife.com slash vega. That's V-E-G-A. And when you go there, you can also leave questions, comments, or feedback for, for Danny, uh, for for Mora too, even though she couldn't join us. Uh, she, I'm sure, can hop in and comment here and there. And, and I'll also take a look at any of those. So I love to keep the discussion going. And again, Danny Moore's website is fatfueledfamily.com. Uh, you can check out uh, all of their writings, more resources on that website as well. So Danny, this has been fun. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing all this stuff with us, man. Oh, man, this is my favorite thing to talk about. Thanks, brother. I can tell. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Well, folks, I'm Ben Greenfield along with Danny Vega signing out from bengreenfieldlife.com. Have an amazing week. More than ever these days, people like you and me need a fresh, entertaining, well-informed, and often outside-the-box approach to discovering the health and happiness and hope that we all crave. So I hope I've been able to do that for you on this episode today. And if you liked it, or if you love what I'm up to, then please leave me a review on your preferred podcast listening channel, wherever that might be. And just find the Ben Greenfield Life episode. Say something nice. Thanks so much. It means a lot.